good afternoon. I'm Rod Chapel, and this is the Rod Chapel Show. Thanks for joining us. We try to bring issues that affect regular Missourians and talk about them in a way that makes sense. Today, it's our pleasure to have Jeff Stack. Jeff, welcome to our show. Welcome. Well, it's good to be here. I appreciate the opportunity, Rod. No, well, we appreciate you. Jeff, would, uh, would you tell us what organizations are you working with? Sure. Well, I've, I've been the coordinator of the uh, Mid-Missouri Fellowship of Reconciliation, gosh, since 87. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a uh, pacifist group, uh, interfaith, international, and our local chapter was founded uh, back in 61, uh, so based in Columbia, but we work with people throughout the Mid-Missouri area. Um, I'm also the... Um, and we, we do, I should mention, we focus on uh, peace and social justice issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we also focus on, have been struggling against the death penalty for, well, ever since I've been a part of it and then before as well they did. Uh, back in 61 when it was founded, people had vigils in front of the uh, Jefferson City Correctional Center back then, our group did. Wow. So they've been, not me, I've not been out of that long. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, so then I also am a um, legislative consultant with Missourians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. And one of our projects is the Moratorium Now campaign. Okay, okay. Well, and that's a large breadth, I mean, between the two organizations. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, well, uh, j just tell me, wh why, uh, why is there a need for your work? Well, Missouri's kind of busy. Been busy for the last many years now. Uh, since 1989 now, uh, Missouri has executed 80 people, which is the fifth most of any U.S. state. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's been a, well, from my perspective and our, and our group's perspective, uh, any execution is immoral and unacceptable. We just feel that uh, it's not the place of a government to kill a human being. You know, if a person is truly a danger, we have prisons that can hold people for as long as it's necessary. It just demeans all of us when we talk about uh, taking out a life to show that killing is wrong. Um, you know, whatever faith people are a part of, you know, if you believe that, you know, God breathes life into you, then let God be the one to take that life out and end it. But uh, we should not be uh, in the business of, of killing and being agents for death. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's far more premeditated in our courtrooms. You know, we send someone to death, we put them in prison and tell the world we're going to kill this human being on a certain day, you know, you know, in a month or whatever it might be. And a person's been living under death sentence for 15, 20 years, whatever. That's a that's a peculiar kind of uh, torture that we subject people to, and their family members, of course, as well. And, um, you know, we just don't think it's very becoming of a so-called civilized state or nation. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why we've been, been at this for so long. And there's a whole lot of other reasons, too, we can talk more about, about why people, even if they support the death penalty or they, or they, they think that the death penalty is, is a moral, moral thing, there are other things that can be troubling, we think, as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, one of the arguments I often hear mm -hmm. is that we have to use this because it's a great deterrent. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that if we show people that we're willing to put them to death if mm -hmm. they violate this one particular yeah. law, among others, yeah. that, uh, that that'll change other people's mm -hmm. minds. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it sounds like with the number of people we've been uh, executing since 89, that might not be as effective as some would imagine. It doesn't seem like it. And, you know, it's really interesting to I saw uh, some interesting reports in the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. You know, last year, Missouri executed 10 people which is the most that our state's executed since um, 1899. You know, so that's a special kind of backwardness that we are showing. Yeah. And, you know, so you'd think that last year would be like the safest year in Missouri history, you know, from years anyway. Right, <laughs> right. But actually, as it works out, St. Louis City, for instance, where most, most of those cases were based out, so there was a lot of publicity for all those executions. Mm -hmm. Well, St. Louis City had their highest homicide rate in the least, least last five years. Good. You know, so if you're looking for a deterrent, there's not much of a, a, a proof there. And, and a, broader, a broader look at it, uh, the United Nations did a study of, uh, they looked at several hundred deterrent studies around, from around the world, mm -hmm. and they found no credible basis for, for the death penalty to be construed to be a deterrent to murder. The thing is, we're talking about individuals who, when people commit murder, typically uh, they're committing in the throes of passion, under the influence of alcohol or drugs, in the in midst of rage. Or in some cases, if they're like a hired killer, they just don't believe they're going to get caught. Uh, so people are just kind of, you know, they're not really, you know, they're not thinking about it. They're not expecting a call. They're just, they're just not in their frame of mind to consider it. A lot of times people are mentally ill. Uh, maybe they might be intellectually uh, disabled. You know, so, you know, it, it, you'd think, you know, intellectually maybe you'd think it might work, but it really doesn't. People are not, 
considering what, it, what, what the kind of ramifications are of such an action. Right, right. Do you have any uh, explanation for why Missouri is kind of outpacing itself? I mean, mm. we're not the largest state in the nation. Not nearly. And, not nearly. Uh, but to rival other states, yeah. I guess, like Texas and some of the yeah. others. Who... It's interesting. I mean, you know, you've got, there's a couple different reasons for it, I think. Well, to begin, maybe just to put things into perspective a little mm. bit. You know, last year we executed as many people as Texas did. Wow. We tied with Texas. And if you look at Texas, Missouri, and Florida, mm -hmm. that's 80% of all executions that happened in our country. You know, so we're, it's interesting, around the rest of the country, the death penalty is, is becoming less and less used. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, last year, the few, it was the fewest number of executions, and I think it was like 15 years. Uh, and then also now, uh, the fewest number of, of death sentences in 20 years uh, in, in the country. In fact, last year, Missouri, uh, Missouri county courts, no county court in Missouri sentenced someone to death. You know, so wow. it's coming into, it's going into disuse, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's a good thing from our perspective. Well, certainly. But, but uh, and you know, it's interesting because in the last uh, six years there have been, uh, or last seven years, there have been six states that have abolished the death penalty additionally. Mm -hmm. So while Missouri is kind of moving forward in a fast way, it seems like, the rest of the country is lagging behind and not, and recognizing that maybe this is not the way to go. So you asked about the reasons why. You know, the death penalty has always been a political tool. I mean, always. And, and I think that really is the, at the crux of this as well. Um, Attorney General Chris Coster is, you know, he's, making, he's obviously making a run for the governor's seat. Sure. And um, what happened about, I guess it was probably maybe, maybe about a year and a half ago, about that time, um, he began to uh, criticize the Missouri Supreme Court for not setting execution dates. Mm -hmm. And so uh, soon after that, like beginning in October of uh, 2013, uh, the Missouri Supreme Court with the new uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Mary Russell mm -hmm. began setting execution dates. So monthly since uh, October of 2013, Missouri set monthly execution dates and she is the as the court judge has, has done that. She's actually, it's interesting, she's told some abolitionists, uh, jokingly, I guess, but she calls herself Bloody Mary Russell. Mm -hmm. You know, so anyway, but that's an aside. But so Rep, uh, Chris Coster, you know, maybe because he sees that there's political advantage, mm -hmm. especially to people maybe, you know, in outstate parts of Missouri, rural areas, mm -hmm. where they perceive that there's greater support for the death penalty as a response to murder. You know, maybe that's one reason why, because years ago he used to pride himself on, on not supporting the death penalty or not, not doing it when he was a prosecutor. But mm -hmm. anyway, you know, this is just supposition. I don't know what goes on in his mind. Well, sure. But, sure. you know, so anyway, the execution dates had been set, and it seems like in a way he's trying to follow the pattern of, of former governor or current governor Jay Nixon. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the 80 executions in our state, mm -hmm. uh, it's real telling because of the 80 executions. Uh, Governor Nixon has had an official hand uh, in at least 75 of them, 74, I think, 74 of the executions, either as attorney general or as the governor, you know, where he, where he, he pushed, uh, worked with uh, county prosecutors for death sentences, or then as a governor, he, he has an opportunity to stop executions. And he, he stopped one so far. He's allowed, I guess it's been about 15 now okay. under his administration. Okay. So that's kind of in a snippet. That may be why it's happened. The other thing, to be real honest, though, too, uh, these folks who've got been executed in this last year, many of them have been under, under a death sentence for quite a long period of time, and they'd run out of appeals. Okay. And so, you know, there's that, there's that reality that, mm -hmm. you know, suddenly it's, you know, dates can be set, you know, and the attorney general has to ask for a date to be set, and then, and then the uh, Missouri Supreme Court justice, or in this case Mary Russell, is the one that's setting the dates. I see. I see. Now let me ask you, we talked about outstate mm -hmm. Missouri a little bit yeah. and how there being some, mm -hmm. some support and perhaps among rural folks. A well, at least, at least that's the perception. That, right. Political perception, right. I think. Is it, uh, is death penalty supported by any organized religion that you're aware of? Or? Not at all. In fact, the exact opposite, you know, because hmm. most, most all major religious denominations in our country mm -hmm. uh, have taken a stand against the death penalty. They have uh, statements that they're, um, their organizing bodies or leadership entities, like the, the bishops, for instance, in the, in the Catholic Church, all four bishops, they've taken the stand years ago. Uh -huh. and in fact, in 1999, when the Pope came to Missouri, the bishops had issued a statement just before to support what the Pope was saying that, you know, in modern day, in the modern day, 
the, uh, the death penalty is unnecessary. Years ago, it may have been necessary to protect people, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you didn't want a person to get free from jail. Well, we have very secure prisons, you know, right. down at the Potosi prison with double sets of electric <laughs> fence, you know, escapes don't happen. Right. So, and we have, the thing about it in Missouri, most people don't realize this, and this is, I think, part of the reason why people in some parts of the state support the death penalty. I mean, in Missouri, as in many other states around the country, if somebody is uh, uh, being considered for a first degree murder conviction, mm -hmm. there are only two options, two sentencing options. It's either life without the possibility of parole. That means you come out in a pine box, right. you know, or the death penalty, also a pine box, but we kill the person, right. you yeah, know? So, so death by incarceration, LWAP, basically, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so those are the two choices. Most people don't realize that. They assume that you know, either it's a death penalty or we're gonna, this guy's gonna get out sometime soon. Right. And that's not the reality. Right. So I think you know, we have some educating to do because I think if most people understand those are the two choices, mm -hmm. that you know, you're, not gonna, you're not looking at a light sentence for somebody who commits a horrible crime. And, and by the way, I mean, our groups, we condemn every single murder. I mean, murder is reprehensible. You know, whether you kill one person, whether you kill 101, mm -hmm. you know, it's all contemptible. And we need, what we need to do in our society, and this is something I think is really important for us to keep on remembering, we really need to uh, mature as a society to a point where we look at murder victim family members you know, and other crime victims. What can we do to help you heal? Right. You know, not to suppose that, you know, a prosecutor suppose that here, I'll kill, we'll get this person killed and your healing will be done. It doesn't work <laughs> that way, you know? So we have to figure out what can we do to support the murder victim family members instead mm -hmm. of spending all this energy rushing to try to kill the person that killed the, their loved one. Mm -hmm. So what we, we really need to do, and we see, I see some of it in our state, but not enough, you know, for instance, you know, if someone's has lost a loved one, a husband or child or whoever, mm -hmm. you know, spouse, mother, whoever, um, you know, we should, as a society, provide funding for these folks to get counseling that they need. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, I had to work with legislators to try to provide funding for a friend of mine whose, whose uh, husband was murdered, wow. and they didn't have the money for, for burial, you know? So those things should be de definitely taken care of. Right. You know, if individuals are, are you know, it's such a traumatizing event, what, you know, what would help them to heal? Like maybe, for instance, some of these folks can't go to work for, say, the next several months or whatever. They need time just to grieve and not, not have to go on like everything's normal. Right. You know, so we need to have provide, provide funding for those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then, ultimately, I think what we should be doing, and this happens sometimes now, to the credit of the Department of Corrections, there is a restorative justice program mm -hmm. and trying to figure a way that they can assist to promote the healing for the, the, the victims, people who lost a loved one to murder. So I'll give a real quick example if I can. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, a friend of ours, um, uh, Valerie Brown, uh, mm -hmm. in Columbia, uh, she, uh, she suffered the, the death of her daughter. Her daughter was murdered, uh, mur uh, her, her daughter, uh, Angie Brown, was murdered by DeAndre Buchanan, her former boyfriend, mm. um, and uh, DeAndre killed her plus uh, two other people, two other folks who cared greatly about him. You know, he was in the middle of a crack and other drug he run for months and months, and, mm. and you know, he made horrible choices and committed horrible crimes. I mean, shot, he shot Angie. They had split up. Angie didn't want to part because he was abusive. Right. And uh, Angie was holding their two children. Uh, Dresha and Dresjane. Dresjane at that time was like maybe three months old. Wow. And, and uh, Dresha was, uh, she was like about a year, a year and a half old, very young, mm -hmm. poor, so, so young. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, he didn't kill the children, but what a traumatizing event for those kids and for the whole family. Anyway, Valerie was obviously, you know, just devastated and the whole family, so many people were affected by it. And so, um, uh, Thankfully, there was some funding for counseling for them. That was very helpful. I didn't meet them until about a year later, mm -hmm. uh, meet Valerie. But Valerie raised her two grandchildren. She still is to this day taking care of the oh. kids. And uh, so what um, uh, initially, initially Val and the families, they decided they, they felt okay about death, the death penalty for, for DeAndre, for what he did to kill these three people. Okay. And so he was sentenced to death initially uh, as they you know, with the death penalty, to make sure we get it right, they have a second required trial. Right. And so, as they were preparing for a second trial, maybe two years later, the three families got together and they thought, wait, we don't want to go through this again. Right. Because it's so, it's re, it re-tears re apart these wounds, you know, mm -hmm. having to watch 
you know, these pictures of their loved ones murdered, you know, and, and you know, go through all this again. So rather than do that, they, they talked to the prosecutor. I, I worked a little bit with their, the attorney for Dan to Buchanan. Mm -hmm. And um, the families decided, you know, if he pleads guilty to LWAP, mm -hmm. we don't have to deal with him again, you know. Right. Then, then we'll deal with it. We don't, we don't deal with another trial. Because with that life without parole, he yeah. never comes out. That's right? right. He's in prison for life, the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So indeed, that's what they went for. And, and he agreed to that. He was fine with that. He didn't want to re-traumatize them either. So, <laughs> so anyway, so what happened uh, as a result of taking that, that plea um, and not going back to trial, well, five, six years, I guess it was probably more like seven years pass. And um, it was like two years ago now. Valerie, uh, and I've been in touch with her for years, you know, because, you know, that's what we need to do in our communities, reach out. Right. What can we do to support? Like, you know, not say, I oppose the death penalty. What can we do for you? you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not my right to say, you know. I don't mm -hmm. know how I would feel if my daughter were murdered. Right. I don't know. I don't want to assume. I don't want to help her never get tested like right. that. Right. But, you know, what can we do to help you with your healing? Mm -hmm. Anything, please, with short of killing a human being. Right. I'm not going to go there, but yeah. I'll, you know, but yeah. I'll understand why you'd feel that way. And, but anyway, um, so she had, uh, for years after that, I mean, she had recognized that she had gone through a period of major alcoholism and mm. just, you know, was tore apart, still dealing with her, her loss. Well, she gave me a call and, and asked, she said, yeah, I, need to, I need to go talk to DeAndre. I want to go talk to him. So I, I got a hold of, I knew about restorative justice program at the DOC. Okay. Called, my, called my friends over there and said, you know, can we get something lined up? And so I got them in touch with, with Val and then Val, uh, through the, through the, uh, Restored Justice Office, they began writing letters back and forth a little bit uh, just to have a, to understand what they wanted to convey. I uh -huh. mean, Val eventually, fast forward a little bit, uh, after a few more months, maybe it was a half a year, mm -hmm. she was able to then go to the prison, okay. go to the prison to visit with DeAndre. And she went there with, a, with a, in her mind, uh, some expectations. I mean, she wanted to see DeAndre take responsibility for what he had done. Right. You know, and she talked to him and, you know, why did you do this to, you know, you're, this woman who loved you, right. you know, and trauma, leaving these kids without their mother, you know, the rest of the family. He couldn't really answer. He, he blamed a lot of it on drugs. Right. And so that was really disappointing to Val. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but she also had a chance to say to him, based on her Christian faith, she said, I forgive you for what you did. Right. You know, and, and she also, at the end, she was talking to them, uh, to the uh, restorative justice organizers with the, with the, the division. She wasn't sure what, how she was going to end things, but at the end, she decided to give him a hug as she left. Mm -hmm. She talked about how she left there with a massive weight lifted off of her heart and her shoulders, just feeling like right. life was reborn for her. Right. Because to be able to say those things mm -hmm. meant a lot to her. So, so I guess that's one other thing. When we have the death penalty, we eliminate that kind of possibility. Right. You know, and it's not going to be that way for everybody. And well, everyone's got to figure out their own path. Well, sure. But we, you know, I met plenty of people over the years who haven't had that path denied because of that. Jim, Jim Hall, whose daughter was murdered, Kelly Hall, and mm -hmm. she was, uh, was, uh, was, was murdered back in St. Charles, and three people were initially, convict, uh, initially implicated in that. One of the men, Jeff Ferguson, was executed this last summer. Okay. And... Uh, uh, Jim Hall and the family all thought they wanted the death penalty. They supported all along, even the night after his execution. Mm -hmm. They um, interviewed. Uh, they got interviewed by media and said, "Thank God this is over. We're so thankful that he's dead." Right. You know, they had this image of who he was. Well, move forward about four months. In October, they finally catch wind. The Hall family catches wind of a documentary that was being made. Finally, was released. Right. Uh, called uh, ex, uh, Potosi, God and Death Row. Mm -hmm. It was focusing on this motorcycle gang of evangel evangelists mm -hmm. coming into the prison, and, and Jeff Ferguson and several, three other prisoners at least were in, featured for this documentary. And um, they interviewed Jeff Ferguson, and I interviewed him as well for some radio shows in Columbia KOPN. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he struck me as a man who was genuinely remorseful for what he had done. He was involved in some restorative justice efforts at the prison. Again, we should commend these kind of efforts. They're really right. invaluable. Anyway, he was part of these panels where murder victim family members or people who had been traumatized by rape or some other kind of violent crime or other crime they'd been affected by, mm -hmm. they'd come to the prison and be in these tables um, uh, you know, or they, they'd be in a crowd and there'd be a group of uh, offenders, you know, who were at a table answering questions. Okay. Not likely the person who committed the crime that they'd been affected by because it was too raw maybe for them to deal with. Right. But at least they wanted to talk about what the violence did to them and their family. And so Jeff was an active part of this for, for many years. But anyway, in this movie, uh, 
Potosi got a death row. Mm -hmm. The Hall family had seen this movie finally in October with the filmmaker who, who got in touch with them because they thought, she thought that it would be good for the Hall family to see this. Well, anyway, Jim Hall saw this in October and just he and all the family members were incredibly upset that Jeff Ferguson had been killed. Right. They, oppose, they now oppose his execution and they are working towards maybe opposing the death penalty because they had this assumption, you know, our society creates this assumption that mm -hmm. individuals who commit these horrible crimes are just, you know, that's who we're defined by, period. Mm -hmm. Well, they committed horrible crimes and the, the reality is, is our lives are much more complex than that. And so Jeff Ferguson was a parent, you know, of two kids, you know, and they, they didn't do a crime, but they got, they lost their father. Oh, sure. And then, you know, so Jim Hall had a chance to, and the rest of the family had a chance to at least see Jeff Ferguson in a different dimension. As so a real person. anyway, so the death penalty, we need to kind of look at ways we can promote healing, and this is not a way to promote healing, I don't think. Right. I right. talked a lot. What, what else do you want to talk No, 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 I appreciate it too, because, and, and it, it, it's difficult to understand how, uh, maybe it's not that difficult. I mean, do, do you see that once uh, victims begin to understand the, uh, the aggressor or the attacker or the, or the murderer mm -hmm. in this case as another human being uh, and take that out of the context of just their own pain, mm. that they have some other type of response, is that? It can be, yeah. I can be, you know, and, and the thing about, I mean, I've talked to people over the years, you know, like one man I remember from Georgia who, uh, he's, he lost his mother and for like five or, five or 10 years, he carried a gun around with him in the hope that he'd see the person. He didn't even know the person who killed his mom, but wow. he wanted to have, he thought there was gonna be some way he'd know, mm -hmm. you know, and so he realized that he was consumed by hatred. And I don't want to presume, I don't want to, I don't want to tell people how they should feel because, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a journey I've ever been on and we need to be coming to our brothers and sisters in our communities with unconditional love, right. you know, recognizing the hurt that they're in. And, you know, maybe they'll never get to a point where they, where they want to forgive the person who did this. But we as a society need to do better to show that we, you know, that we care about them unconditionally. Right. And, you know, and I, my experience has been that a whole lot of times when, when people begin to see, you know, the person who committed the crime as a human being, mm -hmm. life gets more complicated. That's how it was for me. I used to support the death penalty until I met some people who committed murder. But I met them as people first. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I heard about what they had done. You right. know, and it's like my, my, my picture got a little more complicated in my mind. I can so. imagine. I can imagine. Well, and are you working uh, with... Um, are, are you proposing legislation, supporting legislation? Yeah, we, we're okay. really excited. There are several different bills that are really, really encouraging. Um, you know, it's interesting, Rod. We see, we see a real evolution in the, in the legislature. I mean, on other issues, you know, it seems like there's a de-evolution. But mm -hmm. on this issue, we see a movement. In the, it used to be years ago, 20 years ago, when we started doing some lobbying at the Capitol. We weren't having, we were having a hard time finding anybody to sponsor bills, you know. Wow. These days, it's gotten a lot more, a lot, uh, there's a lot more people willing to step up. For instance, um, we have a, a, a bill that has, was introduced just the other day, uh, House Bill 772. Uh, Representative T.J. Berry, a, a Republican from Kearney, uh, mm -hmm. is the sponsor of that bill, and he's been a co-sponsor of such a measure for several years. Uh, he is a conservative by, by all accounts, mm -hmm. and he, is, uh, uh, he considers himself pro-life. Mm -hmm. you know? And so this is an, a logical extension for him. If he says he opposes abortion, Right. You can't say you support the death penalty and be pro-life. That's how he sees it. That makes we'll have, sense. Yeah, I mean, we just got filed. I hope we'll have some more, more co-sponsors. We'll see how that goes. Okay. Uh, in the Senate, we'll probably find out by tomorrow if there'll be a, a, co a lead sponsor of the bill there. We think there's a pretty good chance the Republican will be a lead sponsor then. Okay. Uh, over on the House side, uh, we have a couple different, uh, well, actually, uh, a measure that's, um, that's being uh, advanced, and you did a great job in the news conference the other day in speaking about this issue, so appreciate it, but Thanks. Thanks. a moratorium. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at, um, and this is uh, House Bill 561, Representative John Rizzo, a Democrat from Kansas City, is a, the, prime, the lead sponsor of this bill. Um, we've got a couple, other re a couple Republicans who co are co-sponsoring it so far. Uh, Representative Tom Hurst uh, from, uh, let's see, he's from, oh, I, should have meant, I shouldn't have gotten him there. <laughs> I'm forgetting his hometown. Okay. I'm sorry, Representative Hurst, no, dis, no disrespect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. uh, also now uh, out of Carrollton, uh, uh, Republican um, Joe Don McGaw is also a co-sponsor. They both are, and Representative uh, uh, Bill Lant mm -hmm. from New Joplin area is going to co-sponsor as well. Those are four, three Republicans who uh, 
are opposed to the death penalty as well. Mm -hmm. but, but the particular issue here on the moratorium is, is that um, it, it's a bill, 561 is a bill that would, um, would look at a, a study that was done back and ended in 2012, the uh, Missouri Death Penalty Assessment Study that was done by a group of jurists folks that didn't take a stand on the death penalty, mm -hmm. but just wanted to be sure that there were, uh, that wrongful convictions were, uh, were prevented as much as possible and uh, looking at trying to make a system that'd be more fair. So these group of, of jurists who included, uh, included Judge Stephen Limbaugh from Southeast Missouri, okay. uh, Judge Annette Lowry from the central part of the state, mm -hmm. former prosecutor from uh, St. Louis City and several other former and current judges, law professors, they came together and did this two-year study, mm -hmm. results released in 2012. So this House Bill 561 uh, would um, set up a task force to look at the recommendations of the 2012 report. Recommendations, for instance, to try to standardize the uh, eyewitness uh, procedures done by police departments, try to make sure we get it right, mm -hmm. identify correctly who, who, is, uh, who we might suspect of a crime and begin that path in a good way. And looking at DNA evidence, trying to prevent wrongful convictions. Over on the Senate side, just today, uh, Senate Jill Shoup, uh, a Democrat from Creve Core, she has introduced a bill, SB 393, a moratorium measure as well. Hmm. So okay. we got those two bills uh, that, that have been introduced uh, on a moratorium, and then again, as I said, repeal bill. There are also several other measures looking at different reform uh, possibilities. One bill that will uh, look at doing a cost comparison of uh, death penalty cases and non-death penalty cases to see what the, the true economic cost is. Well, and I, I understood that as being one of the arguments that many people have against it as well, is that right. it is simply very expensive yeah. to try to execute right. someone through this way. Right. Do, do you have an idea in mind in terms of how much money or is that? Well, it's interesting because <laughs> in Missouri, we just don't know, which is really kind of pathetic. Yes. When you think in terms of, you know, uh, there's a lot of people who call themselves fiscal conservatives, mm -hmm. you know, being responsible for the taxpayers. But so far we've been blocked in efforts. Senator Joe Kevney yeah. uh, is the sponsor of a bill to look at that issue. And so he's, he's done it several years and we're hoping that it'll get past this session. Uh, Representative Joe Don McGaw is going to sponsor a measure in the in the House okay. that will be identical too, and it's in a, around the nation. Around the nation, we have plenty of, of research done. Mm -hmm. You know, we found in uh, they've done at least studies in ten states or more, and they found that the death penalty is thirty percent more expensive and up to a thousand percent more expensive. Wow. You know, and so, but in Missouri again, we don't know. We were told a actually when. Uh, Senator Kevney bought the bill two years ago and got onto the floor for debate. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some legislators, I won't name them, but, <laughs> but they got up and they said, yeah, I know it's going to be more expensive. I don't care how much more expensive it is. Really? <laughs> for instance, in, in Washington, they just found out last week that every death penalty prosecution costs a million dollars more than pursuing a case of life without possibility of parole. Wow. And to explain that, I mean, it sounds kind of counterintuitive. The reason right. why it's much more expensive is because at the, uh, the initial trial phase, um, there's a, um, a greater amount of resources that go into these trials mm -hmm. because death is unique. Right. You can't, can't, you can't fix it. No, you can't. <laughs> so, so, you know, there's a, a bifurcated system where they have the trial phase and then the sentencing phase, two separate trials. Okay. Um, each, each death penalty case in Missouri requires two attorneys to be available for the defendant mm -hmm. and the uh, state, uh, the county prosecutor and an assistant attorney general from the AG's office. Okay. A greater amount of money is spent on investigation. The voir dire process and in paneling the jurors is much more extensive because anybody that sits on a death penalty trial has to be death qualified. Okay. Anybody who opposes the death penalty is suddenly is off, the, off that jury pool. Can't, they can't sit in on that, that trial. So it's, it's a much more lengthy process. Mm -hmm. The trials are much longer as well, typically. And so, you know, we don't know again in Missouri how much. You know, all we have to go is in Kansas City or Kansas uh, found they were 70% more expensive. Wow. So that's the closer state that we have some and sense. And they're cheap. Yeah, I think <laughs> so, you know. So Missouri might be a lot more. But at least we're going to find out this particular cost study is a good one. It's very finite. You're looking at 30 cases, okay. uh, 10 cases where the death penalty was sought mm -hmm. but not obtained, 10 cases where it was sought and obtained, and then 10 homicide cases where... Uh, something other than death was obtained, like Elwha. Right. And, and let's talk about that, because yeah. apparently with uh, a murder or more than one murder in mm -hmm. a particular case, yeah. you can end up with very divergent results, oh, right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. What, can, can you talk to us sure. about that and, and sure. what maybe are some yeah. of the causes of that? Well, it, the, the biggest, there's a lot of different issues kind of at play here. I mean, to begin with, the prosecutor has all kinds of discretion as to which mm -hmm. cases pursue for death penalty, which ones not to. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in fact, across the, the state, the uh, county that has by far since death more people than any other county is St. Louis County. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, St. Louis County has, I think it's, I want to say about 15, maybe 20 uh, death sentence cases anyway. I, I'm is not that sure. Bob McCullough again? Indeed, Bob McCulloch, the prosecuting attorney. And it's interesting because if you look at, you know, St. Louis County has sentenced to death ninth most people of any county in the, in the U.S., and it's interesting, right behind it is St. Louis City, but they have fewer. But it's interesting because you cross a line, St. Louis County into the city, mm -hmm. four times more homicides have happened in St. Louis City, mm -hmm. but yet more people have been sentenced to death in St. Louis County. Right. It's really so arbitrary. So many issues that, you know, and it's really telling, Rod, when you look at who's getting the death penalty, as in most, most states, in Missouri, about 2% of all homicides have ended up in a death sentence. Okay. Is it the worst of the worst? Not necessarily at all. Anecdotally, you can find, I mean, among those most brutal crimes in our state's history in recent, recent memory, Robert Burdell is one, mind, one man that comes to mind. Sure. He's a man who sodomized, kidnapped, you know, gosh, 10 or 12 young men. Mm -hmm. Horrible. Put them in barrels, right? Yeah. Well, no, he didn't do that, oh, but okay. he did all kinds in his basement. In he his buried them in his basement after torturing them. All horrible, horrible crimes. Well, he must have got death penalty. You'd think so, but he got sentenced to life in prison, died a natural death uh, in the. In, uh, in the Missouri prison system, you know? And you have, you have people who, and a lot, most of the people, the vast majority of people in Missouri have been sentenced to death and executed, mm -hmm. killed one person, hmm. vast majority. Basically, some of, the, some of the, the kind of common threads here in the case is, there's an old saying, them without the capital get the punishment. Oh. So of all the people who have been executed in Missouri, then 80 people, only one person I'm aware of could afford their own representation. Wow. You know, it's the poor. I mean, it, thank goodness. I mean, the public defenders have done a really good job. They have a, in Missouri, we have a good specialized system for dealing with capital offenses. Right. They've done a good job, but still matched up against a state they can't compare. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to find many poor people in pr or rich people in prison to begin with, mm -hmm. but definitely not living under a death sentence. So, I mean, the other issue that's really telling, the most telling issue of all who gets the death penalty in Missouri and across the country mm -hmm. is the race of the, defend, uh, of the victim. You know, so... So across, across Missouri, for instance, in the 40 years we've had the death penalty, roughly like 60% of all homicide victims mm -hmm. in, our, in our state mm -hmm. were African American. Okay. You know, inner cities, you know, Kansas City, St. Louis, people who've been, you know, in the midst of, of poverty and desperation, you know, people, people are victimized. Oh, sure. You know, so you'd think in a colorblind system, you know, because, I mean, we're fair in the system, right? Our state, right. of course, never any... Supposed never any, yeah, never any inequality or bias here, surely. Right. Well, anyway, in excess of 70% of the people who have been executed in our state uh, were convicted of killing a Euro-American, Caucasian person. Okay. You know, so that's the complete opposite. Now, the reason why that's happening, it, it gets back to the issue of prosecutors. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten, I haven't seen current data. I need to do some more research. But the, the most recent year that we found information, there was 1998, a... Um, a fellow named Pasternak out of St. John's University, I think in, in New York, did a study looking across the country at the race of prosecutors. Looked at the race of the prosecutors in Missouri, and I think it's, I want to say 120 counties. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's close. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. Anyway, found uh, 120 20 prosecutors. How many of those 120 prosecutors making the decisions, which case to pursue for death or LWOP or something besides capital, mm -hmm. uh, capital murder case, what, what number of those 120, Rod, do you think were African-American? 50? Zero. Really? Every, every one of the prosecutors was a Caucasian making those decisions. Now, it doesn't mean that mm -hmm. every one of these prosecutors is a racist. Right. No. But the thing about it is, you know, we're, we're empathetic human beings. We tend to empathize more with people like ourselves. So if you see, you know, you come across a crime scene of a, of a, of a Caucasian woman who's murdered, mm -hmm. you know, more likely maybe to feel empathy for that person and for the family grieving their loss right. as opposed to black on black murder, mm -hmm. you know. And so what's happened, actually, we look at the last year again, the 10 executions in Missouri, mm -hmm. nine out of the 10 people who have been executed, executed this last year were convicted of killing a white person, <laughs> nine out of 10. Okay. Half the people who were executed last year were African Americans, you know. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's the other issue. I mean, you know, 40% of the people executed in Missouri 
or African Americans, far out of out of whack with you know the population. Right. You know, so right. it's, it's a continuation really of, of the slave patterns, basically of the of the lynching patterns. You know, right. but it's it's fussied up in this this garb of justice. You know, mm -hmm. we have the judges. We have you know you walk into court. I go into Boone County courtrooms, and this is you know you as an attorney you see this all the time. Oh, sure. I walk into Boone County courthouse, and you know. The, all the judges are white. The prosecutors are always white. You know, there are, there are some, uh, sometimes African-American attorneys, but as far as the defendants, you know, paraded in from the jail or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, vastly disproportionate to the 15% of the people African-American in our general society. Right. You know, it's a, it's right. a system that's, you know, that's racist, it's classist, you know, but, but back to that issue of the moratorium measure, you know, so, you know, they suggest, they pointed out in, this, in their research they did back in 2010, they, they pointed out that there were biases in the, in the system as far as race goes, looking at mental illness, mental retardation, or now called mental uh, or um, psychological intelligence issues, looking at, at those. So it's just back to fairness. At the very least, if we're going to have the death penalty, we should have it be more fair. You so know, wait, wait, we had judges, and yeah. these are... Some of the judges you, you, you listed, I, I, mm -hmm. I know of and understand their position. The prosecutors, you mean? Or right. Or, well, the, the judges. The right. judges right. 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 Some are on the federal bench. Yes. Right? Yes. I mean, these aren't uh, some small municipal. No. Yeah, federal judges. Yeah, those is, are federal judges. Right. 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 Which may actually. Uh, and, and they said that there are some deficiencies in the Definitely. criminal justice they, they, system. They, they in came out with 99 uh, deficiencies and recommendations. I mean, they saw some strengths in Missouri. They point out a lot of strengths. And again, they looked at the procedures, the processes, uh, how the death penalty works in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And again, several of them are supporters of the death penalty. Right. You know? But they wanted to at least create a system, you know, do what they could to suggest or support a system that was going to be fair and uh, prevent wrongful convictions. And that's kind of, you know, that's our common ground. I mean, I'm not, I don't shy away from the fact that I want to see the death penalty ended. Right. But at the very least, if you want it, if you're going to have a death penalty, let's make sure we get it right. And, you know, maybe we can talk about this now as well. One of the issues that should trouble people greatly mm -hmm. is it's not, you know, this is not a dream that there are mistaken identities or wrongful convictions because, in fact, you know, the reality is, is that in the U.S. now since uh, the 1970s, uh, mid-1970s, soon after when we began executing people, um, 150 people have now been set free, or been, they were been exonerated. They mm -hmm. were convicted, sentenced to death, and then exonerated. At the same period of time, 1,400 people, just about 1,400 people, have been executed. Wow. You know, so it's like Mike Farrell, who's this, uh, uh, who is a mash fame anyway. Oh, uh -huh, sure. You know, he's, sure. He's, he's an activist and leader in California in efforts to end the death penalty. Okay. But he um, he points out, he suggests, he says, well, you know, if you had a car particular make of a car, mm -hmm. and you know, out of every, one out of every 10, or even in the case of Missouri, one out of every nine, or in, in the U.S. now, one out of every nine of this particular model blew up on the road. Mm -hmm. That's a major deficiency, a major <laughs> health. You take the whole thing off the road. <laughs> You'd never you allow know? it, right. Right, and so in Missouri, we recognize there are these problems. You know, when I talk about 150 wrongful uh, convictions and exonerations, there have been four in Missouri. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have had our problems, but uh, you know, so, so it makes sense to have a moratorium, to at least halt executions for two years right. while we take a look at ways we can make it more fair and make sure it's more accurate. You know, last week, uh, Missouri very nearly executed a man who I think is wrongly convicted. I'm not going to say he's innocent. Mm -hmm. Is that Marcellus? Yes, uh -huh. Marcellus Williams. Williams. Yeah. Talk to, would, would you mind telling I'd us be glad to. about his case? Sure, sure. Yeah, he's a fellow who was convicted, African-American man, convicted in St. Louis County, he was convicted of, uh, of killing uh, a Caucasian woman, uh, a woman uh, by the name of um, uh, Miss Gale, uh, Felicia Gale. This is University City. Uh, somebody broke into her apartment, burglarized it, and then she came out of her shower. She was fatally stabbed many times, a couple dozen times. It's a horrible, horrible crime. Uh -huh. And uh, what happened was is that at the scene of the crime, police gathered a lot of physical evidence okay. because when Miss Gale you know, was trying to repel the attack. She apparently scratched her assailant. And so some uh, flesh was underneath her fingernail and blood. She apparently drew blood from her attacker. Wow. And so that was, uh, that was on the, you know, like on the rug and, and other places where her body was found. Okay. Um, at the time the police gathered that information, they did, a, did DNA analysis back at that time. This was in 1998. There was, it was kind of a fledgling mm -hmm. science at that point. Mm -hmm. Well. They, uh, they found, uh, they, they, they checked it, 
and they found that the DNA that they found there did not match Mr. Williams. You know, so yeah, they shouldn't have proceeded further at that point, really. This is I mean, before they ever took him to trial? This is before they found it. They've, but they still went through with the trial. Okay. He was convicted, sentenced to death. They didn't find, they couldn't make a, a positive match with the DNA evidence gathered at the crime scene with anybody. It wasn't, you know, what they found under her, under her fingernails did not match Mr. Williams, did not match her or her husband, mm -hmm. you know, so, but they didn't know who matched. So fast forward these years, these many years later, and, and you know, the thing about these cases is I didn't really know anything about Mr. Williams' case until in December when he got an execution date set for, for January, mm -hmm. late January. Okay. And so uh, we ended up beginning to become aware and realize that he had a case of being wrongly convicted. Right. You know, it was out of public sight until this time. His attorney was surprised that, that the, uh, an execution date was set, uh, but it was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we worked with uh, folks around the state. Uh, Kansas City started a great editorial. In fact, I've got this in front of me. Okay. But it was uh, uh, basically what they were asking for and what the attorneys for Mr. Williams was asking for is, hey, you know, in these years past, you know, we now have this CODIS mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. a DNA database across the country of people who have been who have offended, you know, been convicted. Sure. You know, match it up. Let's look at that DNA evidence now and see if we can get a match. Mm -hmm. You know, because the thing about it, and, and Mr. Williams' case, the reason he was convicted, uh, the the prime the prime uh, witnesses in the case were two individuals. One who they came forward a year after the murder saying that Mr. Williams con, uh, confessed to them about, about doing the murder, committing the murder. They didn't see the murder, but they, they said he confessed to them. And so that became, they became the star witnesses uh, really? in, in Mr. McCulloch's case against, against uh, uh, Marcellus Williams. Uh -huh. Now, to be fair, too, Marcellus Williams did have in his possession some stolen property from that apartment. Okay. So at the very least, he received stolen property, at the very least. Right. But he's, con he's, con he's contended all along he did not commit the murder, mm -hmm. you know? So right. who did, we should find out. Yeah. So thankfully, you know, the, the Missouri Supreme Court set this date mm -hmm. pretty fast, you know, Judge, Judge Russell okay. in her rush to move forward with this process. Right. Anyway, thankfully, though, they r vacated the execution date. Okay. Thankfully, okay. Last, last Tuesday, you know, thankfully. Right. So uh, we're hoping that that means that the Supreme Court is interested in having this DNA evidence analyzed. Mm -hmm. this, a, 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 an attorney in Missouri has said that, uh, you know, other states like uh, Florida, for instance, has had about 25 people exonerated, Missouri wow. four. Mm -hmm. And uh, this attorney was asked, well, why does Missouri have so few? Well, in Missouri, we bury our mistakes. Right. You know, we're about to bury Mr. Williams, right. you know? Came very close. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'd like to think the governor would have halted the execution, but he hasn't stopped many. Right. You know, one man who had a, has a wrong, a strong case of being wrongly convicted uh, is Rick Clay. And the governor, to his credit, stopped that execution. He was scheduled a couple of years ago now for execution. Okay. But um, rather than having an inquiry into the case, he simply said, I think he's still guilty, but we'll just go ahead and, you know, commute a sentence to life in prison without possibility of parole. <laughs> so. You know, different kind of burial there, it looks right. like. Buried, buried uh, bureaucratically. But anyway, so we, in Missouri, though, we've probably executed about five or six people who were wrongly convicted. Well, uh, are there any state resources to help people who have been, or, or, or claimed, or at least mm. alleged that they've been wrongly convicted? Well, you know, that's a great question, Rod, because pitifully, no. Uh, well, the short answer is yes and no, really. Okay. Because if there's DNA evidence available, there is a provision that was passed a couple, couple years ago okay. to try to have a, you know, compensation for people who, who are proved by DNA evidence. But the thing is, DNA evidence is only available in about a fifth of all cases, right. homicide cases. Right. You know, so in Marcellus Williams' case, it is available. You know? mm -hmm. So hopefully, hopefully that will open up you know, different, different evaluation there. But uh, where we're, we were hoping, and we haven't gotten, gotten to move forward before, but of all states, that, the state that has the best compensation package for people who have been found to be wrongly convicted, yes. you and I might not have thought it first off, but you can guess it now since I gave you a, a little bit of... Texas? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, good for them. Yeah. You know, good for them. Mm -hmm. And they've also had a new, new division, a new person who's working uh, to look at cases where there's any chance of wrongful conviction. So they're moving in very progressive ways as well. Really? Missouri hasn't done those kind of things, but... But yeah, they have a very generous package because you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I was uh, outside of the prison. Uh, actually, it was the um, Cole County Jail when Joe Amrine was freed oh. several years ago, yes. tw in 20, 
20, two, uh, 2003, I think it was, or 2005. He was set free. You know, he was released with not even really an apology. He came out of that jail with two, uh, two garbage bags full of his possession, not a penny to his name. As he pointed out to me later on, you know, if somebody is convicted in our state, mm -hmm. they've convicted, a, convicted of a murder. Say they spend 20 years in prison, then they get set free. There's all kinds of uh, official efforts to try to, con you know, support people as they try to adjust to life outside of prison. Right. People who are wrongly convicted, like Joe, mm -hmm. didn't get a penny. They have to go through the court system to get to get some kind of, to sue. Some sort of a civil suit, exactly. and that could take years oh, and yeah. require a lot of it resources. Oh, yeah, it sure can, you know, and so he was mm -hmm. on the streets for many years, you know, while, you know, and so, but the state didn't even offer an apology, you know, so because if they offer an apology, then they're at fault, I guess. They want to avoid that, right. uh, that sense. Right, as opposed to just making a mistake and paying for it. Right. Yeah. So we'll try to keep on working and see if we can move Missouri towards the Texas model, though, mm -hmm. in that yeah. regard. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. They, they do do some stuff right now. Right. Um, now, what about Tim's story? Is that as, yeah. uh, what 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 uh, are the facts regarding his case? Well, his execution is scheduled <laughs> next week here, and so I'm not sure when this will be airing. But he's, Missouri officials are scheduled to kill him uh, a little bit after midnight on February the 11th, that Wednesday morning, and uh, he has contended all along that he is not guilty. His mom is has stressed that as well. I'm not willing to say he's wrongly convicted. I can't say that. I you know, there's some, there's some evidence that may implicate him. Uh, he was convicted of killing his neighbor, Jill Fry. This was in St. Louis County. Okay. Uh, I mean, St. Uh, St. Charles County. And I don't know what happened exactly. She was, she was uh, stabbed to death. Um, a horrible crime again. And I don't know, I don't know if he is innocent. I'm not going to say that. But, you know, I don't want him killed. I know that much. Right. I do know, you know, I, I got off, I talked to about, for about a half hour with uh, his mother, Pat Bosler, who's a dear friend of mine, and you know, what do you say to a person? You know, you tell her, you know, I'm a parent, you're a parent, mm -hmm. you know, our kids may do something wrong down the road, who knows what? Right. You know, he was, at the time, there's no doubt Tim's story was drinking a lot of alcohol. You know, again, he said, I, I'm not going to say he's innocent, but you know, there's some issues at play that I'm not sure about. Not nearly as strong a case of wrongful conditions as Marcellus Williams. And by the way, very few people contend the wrongly convicted, so it's not something that everybody does. I'd say probably maybe maybe a tenth of the people, maybe maybe a fifth. Maybe. Really? So it's okay. not something that people usually accept it, you know, at some point. Mm -hmm. But he's contending he didn't. Maybe he just doesn't want to tell his mother he did. I don't know. I don't I, I could understand that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but anyway it might help the healing if he actually did it to admit it to the, for the family's sake anyway. And the right. Fry families. Mm -hmm. But but in Tim's case, um, you know, there's other issues that are really troubling. Uh, he very likely could have been sentenced to life without the possibility of parole or even second degree murder uh -huh. years ago. But what happened in this case, as happens so many times, uh, it gets politicized. Uh -huh. In this case, um, the first time there was an initial trial and conviction, he was uh, sentenced to death. Uh, the assistant attorney general at the time was a fellow by the name of Kenny Holshoff, hmm. who was working with the, with the, with the uh, back then AG uh, Jay Nixon. Okay. And so in that case, um, Mr. Holsoff was pretty upset, but, but part of the reason why they overthrew the, uh, uh, the death sentence was because of, uh, of uh, misconduct by, by Mr. Holsoff. Among other things, uh, he told the jury that uh, executing Tim, uh, Tim's story would amount to self-defense, basically suggesting that um, that there was the, the the society wouldn't be wouldn't be protected from him unless they executed him. Right. Didn't you know? And he he wanted to kind of create that 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 vision. Again, mm -hmm. we're talking about a, a group of jurors who are death qualified. Mm -hmm. They believe in the death penalty to begin with. Right. And they found over the years that the individuals who are death qualified are also more willing to believe the word of officials, like prosecutors, like police officers, mm -hmm. and more willing to go along with what they propose. So, anyway. The uh, future uh, court ruled that, um, that that was inappropriate, so there's a new sentencing phase that was set up. One of the uh, leaders of the, um, in the Attorney General's office had uh, held a news conference and said that they were, they were interested in considering uh, an alternative to the death sentence. They didn't want to necessarily go through with death again. Right. Well, 
in the meantime, Kenny Holshoff is, is jockeying to become the, uh, a, a congressman from my district, the 9th district. Oh. You know, he's, he was in Columbia. Uh -huh. Wanted to be a, pro, be, be a, new, uh, be a new, uh, new congressperson at this point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, behind the scenes, you know, he works with the family members of the Fry family who obviously are just devastated. You've know, gone through this trial right. and they didn't get a death sentence or it was overturned. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're traumatized. You know, what's going to go on now? You know, they're, they're convinced that this will help with their healing. Maybe, they, maybe it will. I think, you know, if it does, good, but, you know, I don't think it's something we should be doing as a state, mm -hmm. killing a human being. But anyway, um, what happens is behind the scenes, uh, Kenny Holshoff um, petitions the court uh, to become the prosecutor in that case. You know, he wants to pro help prosecute the case again. In part, some might say, a cynical mind might say, because he had some egg on his face, you know, uh -huh. because his, his the conviction, not the conviction, but the sentencing was overturned, a right. new sentencing. Right, based on his misconduct, or, right? Ba right, right. Yeah. And so at the That's time, gotta be embarrassing. it would be. And at mm -hmm. that time, to be fair about it too, then uh, U.S. Uh, Congressman uh, Harold Volkmer, who mm -hmm. had the seat, uh, he had some ads that, in, that talked about how Kenny Holshoff was inept, right. basically, you know. And so Holshoff Because wanted, that, that wasn't uh, Kenny Holshoff's only mistake on oh, a not at all. death penalty case, not at was all. it? Well, not, not, not on, on death penalty cases, on other non-death penalty cases oh, okay. mainly. But okay. well, I can get to that in a moment. I'm glad to. Okay. But, but in this case, so anyway, it became a very politicized case. And so, you know, that offer that the attorney general had of, of doing with something other than death mm -hmm. suddenly got withdrawn because of the political heat. I mean, the Fry family working with Holshoff, you know, and they had a, they had a statewide campaign then. Oh, wow. To bring about, to bring up, to have a, a death penalty case, uh, death being considered again. Gotcha. Ultima and, and ultimately, a court ruled that Holshoff couldn't be a, a represent the prosecution <laughs> in this case. But, but anyway, so it became pl very political. So anyway, the case went on to, you know, it was, it was uh, the uh, sentencing took place two more times. Mm -hmm. And again, he was sentenced to death two more times. Okay. So uh, uh, this, is, this is the nature of it, you know. But... And back to Kenny Holshoff for a minute. Yes, indeed, Kenny Holshoff, uh, as a uh, prosecuting attorney, working as an assistant attorney general, he was cited, and actually you're right, about uh, Rick Clay's case. Mm -hmm. He worked with the prosecution then to pursue the death sentence for Rick Clay. And, you know, it's a, it's a, I haven't never, I'd never had a trial transcript all the way through before. I read through his, and it read like a, a sorry, a sad novel to me, because I knew mm -hmm. how it ended. Uh -huh. So there's no proof here, no proof at all. No physical evidence implicated him. Wow. Kenny Holshoff, what uh, jury, uh, judges had, uh, had cited him for, for misconduct in that case in that uh, the lead, the lead um, eyewitness uh, witness for, for, uh, the, for the prosecution was a fellow named by the name of Rick Sanders, mm -hmm. or Chuck Sanders rather, who, um, uh, who received a deal in that uh, uh, he, he received no, no consequence for his, his, uh, his part. He was involved with, uh, he was a paramour for a woman named uh, Stacy Martindale. Uh, Randy Martindale, Stacy's husband, was murdered. Okay. And so, and Rick, uh, Rick uh, I mean, Chuck Sanders and Stacy uh, Martindale had a child together. You know, Rick, uh, or uh, Chuck Sanders brought Stacy Martindale out for target practice, all kinds of other things, you know. There was, there was a paper trail showing that he was... Uh, going to get a loan, you know, there was all kinds of issues. Uh -huh. But anyway, um, uh, the uh, uh, Chuck Sanders uh, testified against Rick Clay, and, and his testimony was really shaky. He never said he saw Rick Clay commit the murder. You know, it was really vague about being involved in some way, that Rick Clay was involved in some way. Right. But no proof of him being there in the murder scene, and, you know, he was, he was a drug dealer, no doubt about that, Rick Clay was. Oh, okay. But, but Chuck Sanders, uh, he became a more believable uh, a believable witness when during the course of the trial and sentencing that uh, Holshoff asked him on, on the stand, uh, are you receiving anything in, in uh, compensation in exchange for your, your, your support? And they, he said, yes, I understand I'm going to have a, a reduced prison sentence or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. That was as far as he went in showing you any deal. Well, the deal was is he didn't get any prison time. He had parole, mm -hmm. and that was it. <laughs> you know? And, and I, I assume that uh, Holsoff knew that. Oh yes, he did. He knew that, and, and so, so he so allowed judges, him to testify. Right, exactly. When he uh. shouldn't have. So anyway, Holsoff is shown to be go to no have no problems with taking any kind of uh, moral detours to get a conviction. 
in three other cases, three other cases in Missouri, mm -hmm. Kenny Holshoff was the prosecutor working with the Attorney General's office and secured uh, convictions against three people who were convicted, sentenced for murder. Mm -hmm. Three of them, uh, one Josh Keezer, who received a multi-million dollar compensation package. Oh. Uh, Josh Keezer was in another state when the murder happened. You know, but and got convicted anyway. Got convicted anyway because of short, short cuts that, that uh, Kenny Holshoff made. Uh, Dale Helmick was convicted, sentenced to, uh, sentenced to murder for killing his mother, allegedly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he, that case was overturned. Another man, Mark Woodruff, finally had his case overturned. This was in Chillicothe. Ah. Uh, and he was convicted based on just um, fingerprints on a, on a, box, of, uh, a box of shells. Uh, Kenny Holshoff, you know, pushed that. And then he was retried three or four times. Really? You know? But Kenny Holshoff has seemed to be, you know, among the case, situation where we have, um, you know, people going with political ambitions and sometimes over, overwhelming or, or ignoring the truth. It is incredible. Incredible. The, uh, well, you know, I think we've got probably uh, one minute. If there oh, was, okay. if, uh, if the public had an opportunity mm -hmm. To, uh, to stand with you or to stand sure. with their church or, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, Mid-Missouri Fellowship of Reconciliation or any of the other groups sure. who oppose the death penalty, sure. how would you suggest that they best voice sure. that concern? Well, I would encourage folks to, Rod, if they would, to give a call to Governor Jane Nixon's office. You know, there's another man scheduled to be executed, Tim Story. Mm -hmm. um, the other issues of, of some mental problems. He was abused quite a bit as a kid, psychologically tortured, uh, physically tortured, sexually molested. No excuse for committing murder if you did, but people could contact the governor, uh, call 573-751-3222. They, they ought to give the governor a call and express how they feel, even if they support the, de the death penalty, because I think we should have a discussion about that. Also, um, encourage people to contact Attorney General Chris Coster's office. His number is 573-751-3321. Encourage him to back off of pushing for the death penalty. He mm. thinks this is a way to get to the governor's mansion to be next, our next governor. They should hear otherwise, maybe. We encourage people also to come. We'll have protest vigils beginning next week on Tuesday, February the 10th. People can come join us from 5 to 6 uh, in front of the Boone County Courthouse in Columbia. We'll also have a vigil on uh, February the 10th at noon outside the governor's office. So people can join us from 12 to 1. Okay. Uh, welcome to do that. I'm also glad many other people can come and participate in, uh, if they want to have a talk at your church or any other place, they can give me a call at 573-449-4585. And also I'll just mention that there are vigils that will be taking place, 12 different vigils taking place on the, uh, on the uh, 10th of February. And they do all around the state. People gathering in you know, Joplin, Kansas City, Springfield, St. Joseph, St. Louis, wow. down at the Bon Terre Prison, Mid-Missouri. So, People are welcome to join any way they can. And uh, we'd appreciate you know, people uh, plugging in as we can. We want to try to end state murder here in Missouri. Absolutely. Right. Jeff, thank you very oh, much. Sure, sure. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Rod Chapel Show. Today's topic uh, was not one that we hope has a meaningful presence in every viewer's life in terms of having a family member who's been a victim of murder. Or, uh, or, or likewise a family member that's been accused of murder. But I hope that the information was informative and that if you choose to take action, you follow up on Jeff Stack's advice. Make those calls, hold your legislators and your statewide elected officials accountable. Thanks.